talk about chapter 25. Chapter 25 is the lesson that we're going to do, and it has to do with oxygen needs and respiratory therapy. Breathing is kind of important, so I guess we'll talk about it, right? Now, oxygen, uh, you'll always see it charted as O2 because as nurses, we're lazy. We don't write it all out because we have to write way too much. So we will use the abbreviation O2. Now it is a gas that has absolutely no smell to it, no color to it. You cannot actually see it, but it is something that is required for life. Now you will have people say the oxygen stinks, but what they're actually saying stinks is the little plastic tubing that we put around them. Sometimes that plastic has an odor to it that's kind of stinky, especially when you first get it out of the, um, the, the packaging and put it on them. So, but oxygen in and of itself has no uh, smell to it. Now, if we do not have oxygen, we will die within minutes. So it is the absolute most important uh, thing that we do. So um, brain damage, of course, can occur. Uh, we see a lot of drowning victims or you see like even in births, if like the cord is wrapped around the neck, it cuts off the blood supply. By cutting off the blood supply, you're cutting off the oxygen to the brain. So you can see brain damage or of course, uh, some sort of serious illness. Now things that might affect your oxygen needs, um, your respiratory system status. Okay, if you have some sort of illness um, in your lungs, or if you have pneumonia where your lungs are filled with fluid and mucus, then you cannot breathe as well. So your respiratory system status, circulatory system function. What does the circulatory system put through your body? Blood. Uh, part of your blood is hemoglobin. What does hemoglobin do? What does it carry? Oxygen. Oxygen. So if you're breathing, but you can't get that blood through your body to the different parts of the body, it does you no good, right? So also your red blood cell count, which is part of carrying oxygen, your nervous system function, aging, exercise, and so forth. Now, another thing that might affect your oxygen levels could be something like a fever. Maybe if you're in pain, different medications, okay? I know morphine is a good example of um, a, a medication that, that you give that suppresses the respiratory system. And if you give your patient too much morphine, they will stop breathing, okay? But you will see breathing significantly slow down when people get morphine, okay? Uh, smoking. Smoking, of course, damages the lungs, the lining of the lungs, things like that, that is going to affect how the oxygen exchange goes. Um, allergies, if you know, do you guys have asthma? Asthma attacks, have you ever seen somebody having an asthma attack? Yeah. And it's pretty, pretty creepy, pretty scary because they are having such a hard time breathing, okay? Me with allergies, I'm allergic to cats. And last night I went to this lady's house to buy some furniture. And I didn't know it at the time, but Within 10 minutes of me being in her house, I was sneezing and sneezing and sneezing, and my eyes were watering, and then all of a sudden I could feel my chest start to tighten up a little bit. And she has three cats, and I didn't know it because they were all hidden. So would you tell her that you were allergic to cats? Well, as soon as, I mean, I didn't, but, um, I mean, like I was getting so bad, I didn't tell her, like my chest was starting to tighten up, but I was sneezing and sneezing and everything, and then all of a sudden, the her husband's like, are you allergic to cats? I was like, yes. He's like, oh, I'm sorry, we have three of them. <laughs> and I was like, oh my gosh. And like, I, I kept trying to make excuses to go outside in the cold air to help me breathe better and to get away from all those allergens. So, you know, your allergies can't actually affect your respiratory status, because if I had stayed in there, like I would have gotten to the point I couldn't breathe if I'd stayed in there too long. I, it, I have done that before, like been in a place that, that, that had cats and I got to a point like that I was, had, I was starting to wheeze. So allergies definitely affect that. Pollutant exposure, okay, would kind of have almost the same effect as allergies or for more over time. Maybe your nutrition. Um, if your iron is low, and I deal with that a lot, um, 
then your red blood count is going to be low, your hemoglobin is going to be low, and it's going to affect the uh, you carrying oxygen throughout your body. So like I have to take iron supplements all the time because if I don't, I start feeling like crap in general because um, you, when you're anemic, you just feel weaker and, and everything. So uh, nutrition is a big deal. Alcohol, alcohol depresses the brain. It can affect your breathing. So those are just a few things that can do that. Now, if you have altered respiratory function, you're thinking about three different processes, okay? First of all, we need air to move in and out of the lungs. Secondly, we need the oxygen and the carbon dioxide to be exchanged at the alveoli. Okay, now alveoli, if we are talking about the lungs, the lungs are kind of like tree branches, right? So we start out with big branches that go into smaller branches that keep on, and then you have branches from that, right? And at the very, very, very basic smallest part of your lung, you're going to have this little sac here called alveoli. Now, in this sac, you got a lot of your uh, like blood vessels and stuff in here, and this is the actual part where oxygen comes into the bloodstream and carbon dioxide goes out into that sac to be exhaled out of your body. So you inhale the oxygen, that oxygen immediately goes into the bloodstream at the alveoli, the carbon dioxide comes out, and then you breathe out and all that carbon dioxide gets out of your lungs. What happens if you have something like emphysema and that doesn't work? and carbon dioxide stays trapped in there. What happens if it's partially filled with carbon dioxide the next time you breathe in? Do you get the same amount of oxygen if it's already partially filled with carbon dioxide? No. And that's why when you have someone who is in a lot of respiratory distress, they will do a test called a blood gas. And they will check because if you get too much carbon dioxide in your body, it could actually kill you. And you could do it simply from the fact that you can't breathe out. You know, uh, people with COPD, emphysema, things like that, and a lot of that is caused from smoking and environmental pollution. All right, so you have the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide at the alveoli, and then the blood carries that oxygen to the cells in your body and of course removes the carbon dioxide which is a waste product out so um, the first kind of disease we're going to talk about is hypoxia what is hypo do y'all remember from medical terminology what hypo means Under. low yeah it means low uh, below normal slow something okay so hypoxia means that your cells don't have enough oxygen in it, okay? So again, that could be from something affecting the respiratory system. Maybe your brain. Your brain, is, of course, is very sensitive to having inadequate oxygen because your, your brain runs the whole show. So if it is, to any degree, having problems getting enough oxygen, it's going to tell you, okay? And then again, hypoxia is life-threatening because if we don't have enough oxygen, our cells will die, okay? Now, adults, as far as abnormal respirations, we, we have learned that the normal respiratory rate for an adult is between 12 and 20 breaths per minute. Now, if you have regular respirations, most of the time you shouldn't even notice it, okay? I don't notice you guys are breathing because you have normal respirations. So you're not making that much of an effort. It's fairly quiet and regular pattern to it. Now, when you breathe, both sides of the chest should expand and contract equally. It should look, you know, the same. So another um, abnormal respiration you could have is tachypnea. Now, tachy, we learned in medical terminology, means what? Fast. Fast. Exactly. So. Tachypnea means rapid breathing. That means you're breathing more than 20 times per minute. What would cause this? Fever? Maybe. 
what what kind of exercise okay sometimes it may be as simple as mrs h just jogged across the room and now i'm huffing and puffing okay so if we see a patient with tachypnea we need to look past okay you have rapid breathing to the why let's see what's causing is it a normal causative agent like exercise or are they just sitting still and breathing that fast okay so tachypnea is 20 or more respirations per minute hypoxemia hypoxemia we see a lot is because again you don't have enough oxygen in the bloodstream and again they would find that out through either um, when we were looking at the vital sign machine over at Mills and you stuck your finger that little the piece on your finger that was measuring the amount of oxygen in your blood we could tell through that okay it's called pulse oximeter now bradypnea brady means slow so slow breathing so that would be less than 12 right less than 12 uh, per minute and again if you have someone on morphine that may not be super uncommon if you're having to give them high doses of morphine if you have a cancer patient or someone who is in extreme extreme pain now apnea means you're not breathing at all it's the absence of breathing the lack of breathing okay it may come in just periods like when we talk about sleep apnea or if they're not breathing at all forever then that would be apnea as well hypoventilation means that when they breathe the breathing is very slow it's very shallow their chest movement doesn't move a whole lot and you know sometimes you're also going to see irregular breathing they may stop for a second and then start breathing again things like that so that would be hypoventilation and then the most common one you guys are aware of is hyperventilation because when someone's hyperventilating you know you see them they're breathing extremely extremely fast and deep i mean like they're really having trouble keep you know keeping up with with breathing hyperventilation you guys ever done that yeah let me run about a mile and it's on i'll probably be hyperventilating <laughs> it's bad okay so now we have dyspnea this uh, in medical terminology you learn this always means like something that is bad right so dyspnea is difficulty or labored breathing. You can really tell they're having a hard time breathing. Now Shane Stokes is, is one of the breathing patterns we will see. And basically your respirations gradually increase in rate and depth, or they may become very shallow and slow. And you may also see periods of apnea. Okay, and of course that means they might even stop breathing, maybe even 10 to 20 seconds. Okay, so Shane Stokes is a respiration that you might see in what kind of a patient? Any clues? A dying patient. Okay, Shane Stokes is, is a, something you, you would know that you're really, really, really coming to the end of life at that point. If you see these periods of, of apnea, versus you know just rapid or super slow uh, breathing okay now orthopnea means that you can only breathe deeply when you're sitting up of course we've already talked about before that if you have a patient that with breathing problems we're going to want to set them up to help the lungs expand better so orthopnea would kind of denote that they can they can only breathe better if they're sitting up okay then you have uh, what is called bias respirations and they're very rapid and deep but then you have 10 to 30 seconds of apnea okay and this is a little less common then you have two small respirations which are just deep and rapid okay uh, Shane Stokes is the most common one you would report but the other ones are you know are accurate now when you help with assisting or doing any type of diagnostic test with your patients, you um, are going to figure out that you have two types of altered respiratory function. You have acute, which means it had a rapid onset, right? Or in, you have a chronic problem, which has been going on gradually for six months or more. So the doctor can do certain tests to figure out, 
kind of what what the cause is. You know, like I said, we're we're kind of like detectives when you work as a nurse or in the medical field. You're always doing detective work to try to find out, you know, well, what the signs and symptoms are, but even further, what the cause of it is. So the first thing they're going to do probably is a chest X-ray, so we can see if. You know, uh, pneumonia can, can be easily detected with a chest x-ray or tuberculosis, things like that. Then we might see a lung scan where they look a little bit deeper into the tissue. They have bronchoscopies where they actually put a camera down into the lungs so they can look in there and see, like look for scar tissue, look for, you know, just anything that, that might be causing a problem, blood clots, things like that. Thoracentesis. A thoracentesis would, is basically if you have someone who has a bunch of fluid surrounding their lungs they stick a needle through the ribs until they get through that sac that surrounds the lung they poke it through that sac and then you withdraw start drawing out fluid okay and that's a thoracentesis and they can test that fluid to see what you know what kind of cause of agent is in there now we also have pulmonary function test. Have you, has any of you guys done a pulmonary function test before? None of you have asthma, so I didn't know. Uh, pulmonary function test, they will make you like blow into these uh, chambers to see how long and how much air you can expel. And basically they're trying to test out how good your lungs are. But you do that through sucking in or blowing certain devices, okay? Arterial blood gases. That was something we already kind of talked about. Um, with those, they are a little more painful because most blood work that we do, we get from a vein which is closer to the surface of the skin. When they do the arterial blood gases, they have to go deeper into the arm to hit an artery, okay? So those are a lot more painful and you might have to assist a little more with an arterial blood gas. But in theory, nurses don't get those very often. Most of the time, the respiratory therapist will get them or tr certain trained people in the lab will come and get arterial blood gases. Okay, sputum specimens, that's always your favorite one to get. You have your patient cough up a loogie and spit it into a cup so that they can test it for certain germs and blood and things like that. Okay, the pulse ox, which is what we talked about at meals that you stick on your finger, pulse oximetry, which we call pulse ox for short. And basically that tells you the concentration of oxygen in that arterial blood. Now, again, the normal range is 95 to 100%. I will tell you around here, most of the doctors don't wanna know unless it's below 90%. Okay, that's just the generalized practice we do. That doesn't mean 90% is abnormal. It just means that, um, you know, sometimes abnormal is your normal. So 95 to 100% would be the, the range, the, the optimal range. Most of the time we stick it on a finger. It could be stuck on a toe. Even some of them, they do have like little sticker looking things and they stick it on your earlobe. If you think about like babies and different ones that might have a harder time with it, it could be stuck on the earlobe. And most of the time, the ones in the hospital are going to have an alarm on it that will go off if it goes below whatever certain point that they are going to program it in. I would say for sure 90% it would go off. So um, if, the con if the oxygen level gets too low, it's going to warn you. If the pulse in and of itself is too fast or slow, it alarm may go off to warn you or if some other problem occurs, okay? Most of the time it's, well, it fell off or slid off or you know, come unstuck, okay? So, um, a good sensor site is needed. And again, sometimes with kids, it's a little bit harder to do. But uh, the SpO2 is what we, uh, it, it's your saturation, your pulse, and your oxygen. That's what that stands for, SpO2. And that is basically what you are measuring with those. Now, in order to promote oxygen we've got to get air into the lungs right so we need to get that air all the way down to the alveoli so that we can exchange that oxygen exchange that carbon dioxide so your body can work right so we have to figure out ways and plan care for our patients in order to make that happen so the first thing we'll talk about and we kind of mentioned before is positioning 
You have to position your patients in a way, preferably fowlers or semi-fowlers, to, again, to help them sit up and expand those lungs. Now, if they have difficulty breathing, a lot of times they do prefer the orthopnic position. Okay, orthopnic is a position where you're really sitting up well. And then again, you may have frequent position changes needed. Any ideas why you would want to frequently change their pressure ulcers? That is true, pressure ulcers. But from a respiratory standpoint, just FYI, I don't expect y'all to know this, I just asked just in case. But if you have a lot of fluid or mucus in your lungs, the more you change positions, it'll start draining to another part. And that may trigger your cough reflex to cough it out. So if you're constantly changing positions with them, as that stuff, you know, cause you know, you guys know at night time, if you have a cold, when you wake up, if you're laying on your left side, you wake up in the middle of the night, that left side is stuffy, isn't it? But if you roll over to the right side, you go back to sleep and wake up, then the right side is stuffy, okay? Because it drains, you know, gravity pulls it down. So with a, with a patient who has respiratory problems, they have a lot of mucus, just repositioning them in different areas will allow that mucus to drain somewhere else, which will, again, sometimes stimulate that cough reflex to cough some of that out, okay? Now, respiratory support, deep breathing and coughing, we do a whole lot. Uh, I worry about this a whole lot, especially post-surgery, okay? After I had a C-section, coughing was not fun. But, you know, it's, it's you're very high risk for pneumonia after you have a surgery. So they want you to deep breathe and cough, okay? So again, the deep breathing can help move air into the deepest parts of your lung. And then if you can cough after that, it'll help remove any mucus that might be settled into your lung. So the deep breathing and coughing help. Now, post-surgery, when you're doing this, just FYI, when you guys go to nursing school, they will teach you to have a pillow for your patient, and the, the patient will put the pillow on their on their like their stomach and pull down hard and try to cough to try to keep from moving those muscles as much because it really really hurts when you've had every single muscle cut across your abdomen. You never realize how much you you use your abdomen until you get it cut on and then you can figure it out. Okay, so again. We want to prevent pneumonia and atelectasis, which is just that, that mucus and that fluid buildup. So the goal of incentive spirometer, spirometer, spirometry is to improve lung function, okay? The incentive spirometers are um, a little thing you, breathe, you have to breathe and force out, force the air. Um, they'll give it to you in the hospital. I don't know if you guys have ever seen this. They give you a tube. Some of them you blow into, some of them you actually have to breathe in. Okay? And it'll, when you do that, a little ball will go up on a measured graduate. This little ball goes up and they'll tell you, they'll mark it. They'll say, okay, I want you to keep the ball here for at least 10 seconds. Okay? So you'll inhale as hard as you can. Try to keep it there for 10 seconds. And then as you stay in the hospital, then they kind of move it up on you. Okay, now I want you to be able to do this. But this actually forces you kind of to do that deep breathing so that, that you will end up coughing and getting any mucus out. Now, oxygen therapy, you'll see a lot. Of course, if someone has a lack of oxygen, we're gonna give them oxygen, right? So again, the doctors will order exactly how much oxygen to give the patient what type of device to use. It may be as simple as the little nasal cannula that you see most of the time, but some people maybe that doesn't work and they need a full mask. So that is something the doctor would order. They will order when to give it. Some people maybe only need it at nighttime. Maybe during the day they breathe fine, they're up and walking and exercising, and maybe they just need it at night. Maybe their oxygen levels are only dropping at night. So the doctor will order when to give it. Also, the person may need either oxygen constantly or just symptomatically. 
Maybe they only need it after physical therapy when they've been exercising a lot and get out of breath. Okay? So now, you as a nurse aide will not give the oxygen. You can assist the nurse in doing that. And um, most of the time in a hospital, you'll see oxygen given through the wall outlet where they just put a, stick a tube into the wall. It'll say oxygen. And now in the settings that we see, you will either see an oxygen tank, an oxygen concentrator, or a liquid oxygen system. The most common two you'll see in a nursing home is the oxygen tank or the actual concentrator. Now a tank is something that has to be filled or refilled and it would be something you would use maybe like as your patient is wheeling through the facility. Okay, A concentrator is something that actually generates and makes oxygen so it stays in the room and it stays plugged into the wall. So obviously you can't take that with you because it has to be plugged in at all times. So both, most of the time your patient will have both. They have one in the room that actually makes oxygen. You don't ever have to refill it or do anything with it. And then they'll have the tanks that are portable. They take with them throughout the facility or if they had to go to a doctor's appointment to leave the facility, things like that, okay? Now, again, the common oxygen devices are the nasal cannula, which we talked about the little tubes that you stick directly into the nose. A simple face mask, which has holes in it and it's clear. Then you have a partial rebreather mask where you're getting partial oxygen and partial uh, your breathing. A non rebreather mask and a venturi mask. Okay, and each one of those kind of is more highly specified to deliver more more oxygen. Now, when you when you have an oxygen mask on, it is kind of hard to talk and eat. Although, I get hungry enough, I'd try to put it through the little holes in there if I could. So, um, something you need to understand too is moisture can build up underneath the mask. So, you need to make sure their face is clean and dry at all times. And again, when they have to eat, you do have to remove the mask so that they can eat. Now, the oxygen flow rate is the amount of oxygen that is being given. So, we measure that in liters per minute. Okay. Now, either the nurse or the respiratory therapist is gonna set that. You don't have very many respiratory therapists in long-term care, so most of the time it is gonna be the nurse. But in a hospital setting, it's, it's a lot different. Now, when you're giving care and checking on that person, make sure you constantly look at that flow rate. Because it is not uncommon for a patient, if they think, oh, I'm not breathing good, they'll start turning those dials and messing with it, trying to get more oxygen. And they can actually, especially if they have something like a COPD and they can't breathe out very well, they can actually very much harm themselves by jacking up that oxygen. So you really have to keep a close eye on the oxygen levels, make sure it stays where it's supposed to be. Uh, two is the most common setting, two liters per minute. If they have more advanced stages of things, it might be three. I rarely see it over three. So if you come in someone's room and it's four or five liters of oxygen per minute, you better report that, okay? Now, uh, make sure that, again, if you think it's too high or low, that you report that to the nurse and make sure you um, follow whatever policy they have at, at where you're working at as to whether you actually touch that or not. Now, the setup, uh, most of the time, if you do not have water that will help humidify that oxygen it will dry out their nose and their airway really really bad now most of the time we only do that if it's two or more especially if it's over two at two it's optional at two liters but especially if it's over two you have to have these little bottles of saline we stick in there so if you go in there when you're inspecting their concentrator and you see that that is not there, then you're going to report that to the nurse. Uh, distilled water again can be added there. Bubbling, the humidifier means that water vapor is being produced. You should see it bubbling, looks like it's boiling, but it's not. Now, if you assist the nurse, again, you're not, you can't actually give the oxygen and you cannot adjust that flow rate unless the, uh, for some reason your state or your place you work at says you can. 
Yeah. Uh, besides oxygen, sometimes we see a lot of times with patients with inhalers, nebulizer treatments, artificial airways, suctioning, mechanical ventilation, and chest tubes. So all of those are things that you should not necessarily do, okay? Because basically our goals for this is that they can breathe the best they can, get the most oxygen they can, be as independent as possible, and hopefully as possible, return home. Teach them how to use whatever systems they have in place and, and let them go home. Now, they do sometimes have artificial airways to help the airways stay patent. Patent is a term we mean by just keeping it open, right? Keep it patent or open. And sometimes that means that you have to actually insert an artificial airway, and that is called intubation. Okay, when you actually insert an airway down into your patient. Now, you have the oral pharyngeal airway which goes into the mouth, the endotracheal tubes, the ED, ET tube, and tracheostomy tube. You will see tracheostomy tubes fairly commonly. Those are the ones that go into the neck. You guys keep asking me on these uh, mannequins, those holes that are in the neck, those are for tracheostomy tubes, okay? So you'll see those uh, fairly often. We have a lot of people who smoke or chew tobacco around here, and so it's not, that uncommon to have a tracheostomy. Now, with the artificial airways, again, we're gonna to wanna to check their vital signs often to make sure that they're okay and there's nothing like occluding or blocking that airway. You will look for hypoxia. What are signs that someone isn't breathing well? Hypoxia, what, what would that cause when you look at their skin? Blue. What would you see? Blue. Blue, blue lips maybe, okay? Mm -hmm. Blue fingertips under their nail beds, things like that. Um, if the airway comes out, if you come out and you see it, because I mean, it's possible that it could. If it comes out and you see it laying outside, obviously you're gonna report that immediately. Make sure that you give them lots of oral health, uh, oral hygiene care, I mean, because again, that dries out their mucous membranes. Then follow the care plan. Now. If they have an endotracheal tube or the ET tube, they actually can't talk to you, okay? Now, if they have a tracheostomy, they can put a little device in there that closes it off and allows them to talk, but the ET tube, they cannot. So make sure you have that call light within reach at all times, okay? Now, the tracheostomies, sometimes they are for a short period of time. Maybe there was an emergency and something happened, they had to stick one in real quick. But some people have to keep them for the rest of their life because you know, a lot of times, again, due to cancer. So if um, you're gonna see three parts, that tracheostomy, the orbitrator, then you have an inner and outer cannula, okay? And you guys won't have to worry about that right now. The nurse usually, like, again, takes care of all that, cleaning it and doing everything. So again, the tube isn't supposed to come out and it should remain patent or open. It is not super uncommon sometimes if they have uh, mucus that it gets lodged in that tracheostomy and kind of actually blocks that airway. So you have to be careful with that. Now, any 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 problems, you're always going to call the nurse. And again, nothing is supposed to go into that hole or that stoma. I can't imagine why someone shoves something down there, but I also don't understand why my kids want to shove food in their nose and ears. So sometimes it happens. Again, make sure you're wearing gloves, follow standard precautions and bloodborne pathogens because you could, you could see blood. Now, as far as cleaning the tube, you guys might want to clean around it. You know, there's also a little, a little Velcro strap that goes around their neck it holds it in place, but most of the time the nurse should do that. If, um, if you see secretions in that airway, again, we're gonna watch to make sure it doesn't um, like clog up or anything like that and interfere with, with your oxygen level. And again, a lot of times if you see mucus in there but you can't get it out, you try to encourage your patient to cough, okay? Suctioning would be something uh, 
a nurse would do if the patient is too weak to cough or can't cough. We actually stick tubes down in there and suction. We have to be very careful um, while we're sucking up those fluids because you're also sucking out their oxygen. So we have to be careful with that and we can't suction too long at a time. And then we have to give them a chance to breathe for a minute and then we start suctioning again. So again, you have those three different um, suction airways, oral pharyngeal in the mouth, the nasal pharyngeal through the nose, or just the lower airway if you're going through that tracheostomy. And again, um, if it's not done correctly, again, we can cause harm because again, hypoxia. If we suction too much for too long and we steal their oxygen, their oxygen levels are gonna to get too low. Um, you actually can cause cardiac arrest or some sort of infection as possible. Now, in ICU in different places, you might see mechanical ventilation. You've heard of people being on the vent, okay? So that means that you have a machine actually breathing for you. And again, there are alarms on them that would sound if something happens. But again, most time we're gonna see these in like ICU or CCU. Again, if for any reason, when you're in the hospital, um, if you have an alarm, you're gonna check and make sure that the tube is actually connected to the ventilator. And if not, you're gonna make sure you're gonna tell the nurse at once, okay? You don't reset alarms on them. You always have to tell somebody. And again, that only happens if someone is severely, severely sick. Now, chest tubes, again, sometimes you'll see maybe in a hospital setting, and, and it's, it's and usually for one of three reasons, okay? First diagnosis would be a pneumothorax, if there's air in the pleural space, hemothorax, if there's blood in there, or a pleural effusion, which means air is just escaping through a hole. You know, there's a hole in the lung and air is escaping out. So again, the chest tubes are gonna be attached to a drainage system to drain into this little kind of baggie. And then it would be water sealed to keep any, any air from coming into the lungs or escaping out of it. Now, just make sure you know what you can and can't do when it comes to oxygen therapy, chest tubes, all the stuff we've talked about. Make sure you know um, what your facility says about that. And again, just try to protect the right to privacy. You know, you shouldn't be giving out information about the therapy people are getting. Okay, any questions on respiratory oxygen?